Since 2012, with support from the Department of International Development, DFID, and Trademark East Africa Timea, the Eastern African Sub-Regional Support Initiative for the Advancement of Women, IASI, has worked closely with the women cross-border traders across the six ESC countries to enable them understand and exploit the opportunities offered by the ESC integration process and specifically the customs union and common market protocols. Unfortunately, the women traders are still challenged in their understanding of the rigorous tax administration system and as a result, majority have remained in the informal sector failing to reap the benefits of regional integration. IASI, with support from the Foundation Open Society Institute in cooperation with the Open Society Initiative for Eastern Africa, OSEA, is working towards the enhancement of an improved trade environment for women. IASI has supported the formation of 14 women traders associations with over 20,000 women traders across the region. IASI has also facilitated dialogue between women traders and border agencies and revenue authorities on challenges specifically faced by women trading across the borders. In so doing, IASI would like to have fair administration of taxes by revenue authorities across the ESC partner states. The United Nations estimates that more than half a billion women have joined the world's labor force during the past 30 years and women now account for more than 40% of workers worldwide. In East Africa, women participation in labor force constitutes over 60% in partner states. It is therefore worth noting that the quantity and quality of women's contribution to socio-economic growth should be considered central to the development of the sub-region. East Africa's culture of patriarchy favors men who are more likely to be the voice of the family, to be heirs and to own land. Naturally, such a cultural bias tends to edge women out of prominent positions in business or from being entrepreneurs. Trading across the common borders has existed for generations within the East African region. Communities that live along the borderline have always moved back and forth to exchange goods and services. The adoption of the East African Common Market Protocol aims at enhancing easy movement of goods and services across the region. As more women, especially small-scale traders, enter the business, they encounter insurmountable challenges which deter them from enjoying the benefits of fair trade and ability to profitably grow their businesses. is Busia one-stop border post, one of the numerous border crossing facilities built under the protocol to ease trade across the borders. The one-stop border system brings all government regulatory agencies including tax collection bodies of the two neighboring countries under one roof. One-stop border posts have been established on common border crossing points, Mirama Hills with Rwanda, Elego with South Sudan and Mutukula with Tanzania. This is a move that aims to eliminate delays and minimize unnecessary bureaucracy for traders that transact across the common borders. But for women small-scale traders, the promise is yet to translate to reality. Mariam Babu is a woman cross-border trader from Uganda. She started her business as an informal trader before she took advantage of the one-stop border facility to become a formal trader. Yeah, when I'm bringing the eggs, first of all, I have to get my invoice and the receipts, which show that these eggs originate in Uganda. When I get the receipts, I get the certificate of origin from the trade information desk in customs. 
After getting the certificate of origin, I visit the my office for the FITO art certificate. When I get the FITO certificate, I don't again stop here in Uganda. I go direct to Kenya, whereby I shall be cleared by the health department, then the vet department, finally the standard SWAT section, and be released and take my goods into Kenya. However, this elaborate process is not favorable to many small-scale women traders. Violet is a cross-border trader plying Uganda-Tanzania border at Mutukula. A single mother struggling to support her large extended family, Violet deals in locally made butter and seasonal edible grasshoppers locally known as nsenene, a popular delicacy in the area. She has a difficult time understanding the prerequisite paperwork for her unique goods that are highly marketable. Language barrier, not only Swahili, but even in English. When it comes to some traders in, in, in Tanzania, they don't understand English and Uganda. They only understand Swahili. And when it comes to our women here, some of them, they don't understand Swahili and even English. But when it comes to papers, they are brought in English, which, which maybe forces these women not to understand some of the policies, some of the taxation. They have to do what to pay. Everything is brought in English. And some of our women, uh, literally, very, they've got a low education. Their literacy level is very, very low. That's why maybe they don't understand some of the things. The biggest challenge faced by women in former cross-border traders is lack of adequate funds to support businesses. Most of these women have small capital investments and can only manage to purchase goods within a range of $50 at a time. Although many of them are aware of the existence of the one border post system and would wish to trade in a formal way, quite a number are kept out of the system because of inadequate capital. It is early hours of afternoon. Akelo and her colleague Adong, not their real names, are weaving their way through the bushes within the no man's land along the common border of Uganda and South Sudan in Elego. They are sneaking their small merchandise a 20 liter jerry can of cooking oil and a hand woven mat from South Sudan to Uganda through an ungazetted route along the porous border to avoid paying taxes. To them, this is the only way they can earn a survival and support their families. An entry into formal trade is a far cry for them. I'm selling cassava, sorghum, and other things, including the cooking oil. I'm also selling. But sometimes it's also very hard for me to get some money to pay in a UR ahead. So what I normally do, I have to smuggle. Like a cooking oil, I pass via without a crossing from UR ahead. So that I get at least little money because the payment I cannot afford my sister. Why is it that it's, it's better for you to, when you buy the cooking oil, pass through the Panya route mm. instead of passing through your head? Because I'm fearing, because I have no money, the money I have cannot be enough to pay the URA people. Because like for them, they are charging like, uh, sometimes a jerry can, they have to charge like 45,000. And yet from the Sudan, that side, I'm buying at uh, 68. And again, if I'm to pay the URA at 45, the money now will go beyond. And in Uganda here, they are selling cooking oil in Uganda here at 90,000. You see now the difference. When I just cross, when they caught me, I leave to them. But I survive, I cross, I come with it and I sell it. At least I get something later from it. Nachimuli, not her real name, is an informal trader along Tanzania-Uganda common border at Mutukula. 
She deals in rice, one of the items on high demand in Uganda. She can afford to whisk in a 50 kilogram bag that she subsequently breaks down to sell by kilogram. With her limited capacity, she finds it impossible to compete with the big importers and will not attempt to declare her small quantity of rice to customs, where they are bound to subject it to taxes. So, she risks the precarious smuggling route. <laughs> Mkaguze Tanzania, emituwalo kumi na gumu. Katiwe mkagule Tanzania, emituwalo kumi na gumu. Mkaleta wanukumpi. Hmm? Katiwe na kaisa wali mkastoms. Sima nisi ndi zibake na kunze. Jako, jako weka ngabansi jieko sente. Nga nyingi. Ate mkaguze emituwalo kumi na gumu. Ngene mkastoms insasule o msoro. Ate male njino kuteka kwa transporti. Hei no katu usa kuduka hali yange. Uruva nyuma tenta nikuwe okutunda kilo kukilo. Ochiraba, paka wena ajimali lao. Kati ogena neweka nganga sente. Amago bage nandi funyeko. Ngatenga wada abashi. Aba customs. Yensonga luwachi nti. Nkagula, nefu na wenka kweka. Nemba nga anteka mu transporti yeka na sente ze nkaguzi. Treatment for a big person. I mean a big importer. It's the same treatment for the small importer. If it's 18% with on tax, I mean for uh, VAT and 6%, it's the same we charge on the small importer. We don't have preferential rates for small importers less than $2,000. But what we do is we have a, a procedure called the PB4. This is for baggage assessment for the small importers. This one does not require an agent. It's a customs officer who will make that document so that the small importers pay without involving clearing agents. Even some women with limited capital who have made an effort to join the formal trade are struggling to stay afloat. The little one that we have, it is less than $50, but still they are charging us on it. So it, it has become very difficult for me to uh, to to even to, to even grow up with that with my business because the little that I have they still charge it. Insufficient capital to trade in large volumes further subjects them to additional disadvantage that drives them into informal trade. Jane, not her real name, is a Ugandan informal trader who deals in eggs and milk. She uses the informal route through Sofia a sprawling market that straddles the common border between Uganda and Kenya to transact the two items on high demand in Kenya. She resorted to this business following loss of her shop during a local town council market redevelopment. Although her goods of trade are not subjected to import duty, she is required to meet other health inspection certification in addition to owning a storage facility on the Kenyan side of the border. For now, her limited capital can only enable her to transact at that level. Eggs and milk eh, are not taxable. You, you can trade freely across the border, but uh, that means you should, you should have a store or a shop on the other side. And getting a shop on the other side is not easy. It's true, we don't have enough capital. Because like these eggs, we have a supplier who brings it from, brings them from the farm. He supplies, we sell, then at the end of the day, we bank his money on his account. So we have limited capital, uh, making it difficult for us to establish a shop or a store on the other side of Kenya. Ogenda genda wali ofune certificate of origin atenga eba yeta agisa yeta agisa ngo ina ku sente kati nze ndi mukazi singo maza alabirira abana nga ka sente akali badde kagama nti ka musoro gigali badenga amagoba agange obochitegera 
kati bwogama nti atoge ndosa sulo musolo bananga mazima togenda kumalako women who are forced to take the precarious informal routes no doubt face numerous challenges not only do they risk facing physical danger while crossing but are also subjected to illegal checkpoints where money is extorted from them by unscrupulous government officials Khalifa not her real name is a cross border trader from South Sudan she crosses into a legal market to buy vegetables and cassava for her small restaurant in Nimule. In order for her to be in time to serve her morning customers, she does not go through the customs counter to declare her merchandise as a customs formality requirement, even when they do not attract any taxes. Going through the office, having the papers, because you know there's a long queue. You'll find when people are many, you'll be moving from step, step to steps whereby it will take long. So that's why we, we, don't, we don't tend to go through the office. As a result, the unscrupulous government agents who waylay them on the way take the advantage to extort money from her. With vegetables, it has little what? Profit. So that little, little profit, little money we give, that means I'm giving out my profit. Crossing on the other side, we have two checkpoints. There is the, that in, they are all informal. There's the police checkpoint, you pay something. Then there's council, you, you pay the dues, eh? market dues. I was also an informal trader. But what I went through, I went through a lot of harassment. In those Panya routes, there are rapes, there are confiscation of goods, there are bribes, there are all sorts of harassment. Uh, first of all, they experience sexual harassment. Secondly, they experience safety because there is that process of hiding something and then you go, you get another one. So after, f then you find the other one you hid first, it's already stolen, so you had to go back and then get others. There is uh, even uh, ex high expenses of uh, people, of the laborers. They can tax you high because they see that you don't, have, you don't have any other alternative. You have to use that road. So they, they may tax you highly, those ones that will make you cross. As you see, when we are crossing around here with the border border, when you have a certain consignment like a bag of rice, the border border man has to ask you for any amount of money because it's something risky. And he claims that I'm also risking carrying you up to that, that, that place. So there is safety, there is sexual harassment, uh, there is tension. People are not, uh, uh, they have that tension. They are risking a lot. According to the East African Common Market Protocol, Goods produced within the trade area are exempted from import duty of 25% as long as the trader can present a certificate of origin. But this provision is not well explained and understood by the women cross-border traders and is not usually adhered to. Besides, discrepancies of tax policies within the member states further complicates the matter. Some products like sugar, like rice, like cooking oil. Those are the products that are manufactured in Uganda, they are exported, but because taxes the other side are very little, they would want to bring those goods back into the country, which is very bad. Yeah. So how are you handling it? How are you dealing with it? We tax them, we give them the normal rates. Okay. We use the normal rates, we don't subsidize anything. As long as this product is manufactured from Uganda, and it goes to South Sudan, and then it is back, they have to pay for taxes. In addition, Goods below the value of 2,000 US dollars, which most women cross-border traders transact in, are subjected to the same tax policies, contrary to the provisions of the protocol. Like the government today is saying there is a free trade regime. And when you come in, you find that it's not true. Because at least I did an experiment, I tried it. 
because I was like wondering why is it that my women are not passing through the gazetted area, yet we have this simplified trade regime. We were trained that women who are under the 2,000 US dollars, you have to, you don't have to pay anything about, uh, apart from withholding tax, which is only 6%. And then I tried it myself. I went to Tanzania. I bought uh, 100 kgs of rice, and I got uh, an invoice from the, from the shop where I bought. I went to Tanzanian customs. I got a simplified certificate of origin. But on my way coming, they told me, oh, no, you have to go to the agriculture office also and see. When I reached there, they told me to pay 46,000 Tanzanian shillings, which is equivalent to like 60 Ugandan shillings. And I was like wondering, why? Why am I paying this? And then they told me, yeah, it's a standard figure. It's a standard fee. Whether you have 100 kgs, whether you have 1,000 kgs, or 10,000, you have to pay this. Some traders would want to use that chance. You get. Uh, you would, you, today you would bring two sacks of rice. Tomorrow you will send somebody to get five sacks of rice. Then in, the, in, the, in a week, if you are to calculate, somebody would have taken almost a ton of rice. So we use this, our discretion now. We profile. We say this person passed here. We gave him a, a bag of sugar. He told us that he has a funeral right. That's why actually that's most of the excuses they give. Funeral right. The other time, children are going back to school. But when we say it is now beyond, we now tax. Like for the cooking oil, I begin from it. For the cooking oil, when you want to buy from southern Sudan, you have to buy and you cross, you clear it. But the clearing for the cooking oil is 45,000 per jerkin. This container, this jerkin. One jerkin is 45,000. If you have like a five, you have to calculate. It's the same with the mat. If you buy a mat, you have to cross from your hair and you pay a tax for the mat. Per mat is 5,000 sometimes, the one they are charging. With all the challenges that informal cross-border traders face, some that have broken the barriers and gone formal enjoy the benefits that come with transacting business in a transparent manner. Nechiranda Jessica is a Ugandan medium-scale formal cross-border trader with an estimated capital investment of 50 million shillings. She trades in grains and has benefited from tax education organized by civil society organizations. Emisomo jono jiba jetu zetu fona, eja yase, eja che, eja trade maka, jitu yambie kwa kwa hiyo ngeru kumanya chichi chetu ino kola. Chunichibe langa changu ye okutu, fumbula nga bachala, nti obo wado solo kukuta, no manya nti solo kuyiti ya mogu kwerufu, atino sika langa okula bulonji. As for Evelyn Ayo, a trader across South Sudan Uganda border, the decision to go formal shields her from risk and inconveniences most informal traders encounter. When you pass through formal trader, it's, uh, it's like you're keeping your goods from being at a risk of uh, smugglers. Because if you pass through the other informal trade, you end up losing your goods in the hands of the smugglers. So that's why I've decided I should pass through the right procedure so that my goods are safe and I make some income out of them. When you are using panya root about time, you are just hiding, hiding. You can hide from morning up to afternoon. But when I'm coming to, through customs, I can use only 30 minutes or one, one hour to process my, my documents, then I proceed. As the region makes a push to increase its tax base, women cross-border traders find themselves in a predicament on one hand, the hazardous business of smuggling puts their lives at risk and they suffer losses. While on the other, the barriers to formalize their businesses remain numerous. As a result, the need to have a common voice to articulate their problems becomes more pressing. They are forming partnerships with civil society organizations so as to amplify their voice to advance their grievances. One of the biggest challenges we still have at the most of these wonderful border posts that have been built is the issue of giving information to everybody. Because uh, uh, we are few 
people, of course, with limited resources to reach out to everybody. So it is a massive campaign that we must have to see that everybody is brought into the fold and everybody is assured that once they get into the formal trading system, there are benefits that come with it and they are able to share into these benefits. But as long as they don't see the benefits, chances are they will remain informal traders. So we must ensure that information is given out and also the structures or the uh, systems, for example, the revenue authorities, the customs bodies, the immigration, they work together with civil society and also with the women the women cross-border traders and also the general traders to ensure that they build their confidence to trade with dignity. This will help make women cross-border traders' businesses more profitable and sustainable while making cross-border trade in general more efficient and less cumbersome.